I think that people got to realise that the birth of Irish democracy took place in Belfast. It was the Presbyterians and their thinking that changed home. It's been the biggest rebellion ever. Over 25,000 people were killed. That's probably the biggest casualty list in any battle that we know of. A lot of these people are suspiciously being killed. And to kill the revolution, you need to kill Tom. So if Wolf Tom landed in Ireland and the French beat the English, yep. would we be speaking French, do you reckon? Hi everyone, it's Stevie from Ireland Before You Die. And today we're in Belfast and we're here to meet Sean Napier. Sean is a historian and a 1798 tour guide. For anyone that doesn't know, 1798 was a really important period in Ireland's history. It was the period of the United Irishmen, who were men who came together with the goal to unite all Irishmen under the one banner, Catholic, Protestant and the centre. This movement inspired further movements such as the 1916 Rising and the Irish War of Independence, which ultimately led to the creation of independence for most of the island of Ireland. So we're here to meet Sean, have a pint with him, and to learn what this period was all about. Let's go. Hi Sean, thanks for meeting us. Roger. Firstly, don't you? Yep. Good man, thank you. Mmm, <sighs> lovely. Oh, lovely, I must say. Great Guinness. Good after a good day out. Amazing uh, Garrick bar. Absolutely, good bar indeed. Bit of history, bit of pedigree this bar. Yeah. So Sean, you are a historian and tour guide for 1798, well the period of 1798 and the United Irishmen. Can you just Tell us what was the 1798 Rebellion and who were the United Irishmen? Well, suppose in Belfast in the 1790s, uh, sort of, it really all goes off really from the Enlightenment era. And the Enlightenment era is very, very important where you had different ideas coming out of Europe. You had the American Revolution happen in 1775, and after 1775, you have these ideas from Thomas Paine, the rights of man, all these writings of these great enlightened writers and it starts to be read by the locals over here particularly the, the merchant class mm -hmm. the presbyterians the dissenters who were quite radical on their thinking and presbyterians by their nature are quite radical here at that particular time so of course in the 1780s 1790s there was the rise of a group of people in belfast uh, the dissenters mainly mm -hmm. dissenters and they decided to found the society of united irishmen based on the principles a of enlightenment and the principles generally of the French Revolution, mm -hmm. which of course is equality, liberty and fraternity. And they espoused those ideas, mm -hmm. they espoused the great thinking behind it, and they wanted to see that happen in Ireland. They wanted to free Ireland and unite the people under the common name basically of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. Mm -hmm. So the United Irishmen in Belfast at that time, like who, who are the main leaders of the revolution? It, at that particular time, uh, we have Wolf Tony comes up from Dublin and you have Thomas Russell who comes up from Dublin. And they're both sort of a, a package that come up here. But in Belfast itself, before the, the likes of Tony and Russell came up and many others, it was mainly the likes of Samuel Nielsen mm -hmm. and we also have Henry Joy McCracken. You have Sinclair, you have Mateer, you have uh, the likes of uh, William Drennan, who is a, a doctor in Dublin, but he is actually from Belfast. He's the son of the manse of the, the first church in, in Rosemary Lane. His father was the minister, but he was writing and influenced in Belfast from Dublin. Mm -hmm. So a culmination of all these individual people from, as I said, Drennan and right through to Nielsen. Nielsen's a very big ca character here in Belfast. We always hear about Nielsen and McCracken. Mm -hmm. And they amalgamate and become the leaders of the Republican-minded people of Belfast. And they're all Presbyterians mm -hmm. to the man. So like, basically they're from a Protestant background? Yes, they're they all. They like Republicans? Yeah. So that'd be quite yeah, mad I mean, for someone to hear that yeah, in it, today's context? People don't realise in those days there were three classes of citizen and they were basically, the first class of citizen in Ireland was the Protestants, the Anglicans. The second class of citizen were uh, your dissenters, 
they were the dissenters were the Presbyterians or Quakers or anybody that wasn't basically Anglican in that you know in that, in that side, and of course you had Catholics who were the third class citizens, mm -hmm. and of course you probably even say you had a fourth class of citizens which were women, and they were treated not very well back in those days. So you're a, you have a quite a lot of a stratified system in Ireland of the 1780s and 90s. So these guys, I take it they were highly educated, the United Irishmen. What yeah. inspired them to do? The revolution. Well, most of these United Irishmen were fairly well educated. A lot of them were businessmen. They were fairly wealthy. Uh, Samuel Nielsen himself. Why someone who's wealthy want to well, this change, this change the whole, their society? Yeah, I mean, why? because they believed in rights. They believed in equality, and you know, they had. I mean, they they could have done quite well. They could have went on and become very successful. They were very successful. They come from very successful mercantile families. In particular, uh, all of them were making money. But they felt uh, the, the ideas of enlightenment had you know, get into their bones and the ideas of equality and the ideas of the French Revolution had really changed them because what they wanted to do, they wanted to reach out to their neighbours, their Catholic neighbours, and show that they believed in equality, and which is a great thing, uh, which was happening at that time. They wanted to help and emancipate Catholics. They wanted them to have the same rights because you can't be an abolitionist against slavery, which was a big thing at that time, yet just completely ignore your neighbour who at that time wasn't able, who was still suffering under uh, very much the penal laws and not able to elect uh, someone of their religion to go into Parliament because at that time uh, Catholics uh, were not allowed into Trinity College and Catholics or Presbyterians for that matter were allowed to go into Parliament either in Dublin which was the main, they called that the Ascendancy Parliament. So in that Ascendancy Parliament it was only Anglicans could go into it. So Presbyterians couldn't go in and Catholics certainly couldn't get in and in Trinity College it was changed quite late in the 1790s that Catholics could actually go into it. So Catholics were generally not allowed into anything. They weren't allowed into serious areas of law. They weren't allowed into teaching. They weren't allowed into government and any big government job. So a lot of grievance going on there. And these United Irishmen came along, based out of Belfast, may I say, and they started the ball rolling to get people their rights. So you could say that basically the Irish Republic you know, it's, has its capital in Dublin. Yeah. It was sort of founded here. Yes, in many that would be, ways. That would be yeah. hard for someone <laughs> not from here to grasp. I, th I think that people got to realise that the birth of Irish democracy took place in Belfast. It was the idea of republicanism, the idea that it was, we're not a, we don't believe in monarchy, as in they were able to question monarchy. Of course, this all goes back to Thomas Paine and his writings about the rights of man. And the rights of man was known as the, the Quran of Belfast, according to Wolf Tone. Wolf Tone described Belfast of their enlightened thinking, he called Belfast the Athens of the North because all thinking and ideology and radicalism was coming from Belfast, it wasn't coming from Dublin. So Tome and Russell and many others were attracted to Belfast because of their enlightened politics and Tome mentions himself, it's because of their religion, the Presbyterian way they thought, where the Presbyterian mind ticked, that this was the place to be and Tome wanted to be in the middle of all that and of course you could say, yes, the birth of Irish democracy does come from Crown Entry and Crown Tavern in 1791. It all began there. That's pretty cool. Cheers to that. All right. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned there Wolf Tone. Um, I think when a lot of people hear the, the name Wolf Tone, they think of the Wolf Tones, the <laughs> Irish folk yeah. group, um, yeah. the Celtic Symphony and all that. Yeah. But um, who was Wolf Tone? Well, Wolf Tone himself was... Is he was, the leader, I take it? Well, Wolf Tone is the guy that comes up with the idea of the Society of United Irishmen. Uh, so much so that it, it's actually influenced by other people and his tone that crystallises the idea. The ideas he picked up from various people, particularly William Drennan, the Belfast son of the manse, son of a, of a minister. And it is really tone taken to the next stage uh, of Drennan's idea, this sort of brotherhood for independence, for self-determination, and tone takes it to the next stage. And Wolf told himself as a young barrister, he'd studied at Trinity College, he'd went over to London, and at that time he couldn't really fit in to being, you know, at that time a, a, man, of the, a, a man at the bar, as you could say. He basically wasn't cut out to be a lawyer, Mm -hmm. And he says so himself in his diaries. Um, but he comes back to Belfast, or should I say, he comes back to Dublin and he starts to write for local journals and writes pamphlets and different things. In those days, people wrote pamphlets, not books. And Tom was really good at it. And he would be writing pamphlets and stories about 
the ascendancy parliament, which they really called it in Dublin, which was the Protestant parliament. Mm -hmm. And he wrote these very good critiques of what was going on, maybe over the strangest of things. But Tone got noticed for being a really good writer. And he was picked up by a bunch of guys in the north, uh, a club, a wig club, and they called them the Northern Wig Club. Mm -hmm. And the Northern Wig Club had asked him, listen, do you want to write some stuff for us? You're, you're pretty good. And he starts writing for them. He starts writing these fabulous pieces. So it comes to the stage where Tone is actually invited to Belfast. And he comes up to Belfast in 1791. And he accompanies his friend, uh, Thomas Russell. If you probably know Thomas Russell, he's the man from God knows where, beloved of the people of Down. Mm -hmm. And he actually met Russell the year before in the Strangers Gallery in the Irish Parliament, where they're both being really nosy, finding out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And Russell and him strike up a great relationship, and they become friends, a, a very, very close friends. Tone uh, absolutely loved Russell, mm -hmm. and they both loved each other. But these were two of the greatest figures. Of course, Russell himself was a cork man and Tone was a Dublin man. But most of all that shone through was the Republican politics of enlightenment uh, from the Belfast Presbyterians. They were Tone's guiding star. Believe it or not, it was the Presbyterians and their thinking that changed Tone. Mm -hmm. And so they were as much influential on Tone as they were on them. So what significance did the rebellion of 1798 have on Ireland and the future? Well, in many ways, it's, it was a terrible failure. At the end of the day, 1798, it fell apart, and that's due to many issues. It was one of the biggest battles, if not the biggest battle, in battles that were held throughout Ireland and rebellion broke out. So there was, there, a, lot of, well, there was a lot of fighting going on around the island at the time? Too, there were uh, this, different this, counties. This no, the biggest yeah. rebellion for It's been centuries. the biggest rebellion ever. Really, uh, the biggest rebellion. Uh, over 25,000 people uh, were killed. That's probably the biggest casualty list in any battle that we know of in 1798. It was actually preceded the Act of Union. And it was because of that battle and, and the various battles held across from down, from the Battle of Balnehenge, from the Battle of Antrim, right down to Vinegar Hill and Wexford and various battles throughout Ireland. And that Ireland today was very much shaped by that because it made the British realize that Ireland needed to either go into Union and she needed to be held by force and it created a whole line of issues but it also apart from being the fact that it was a failure it also was a great inspiration to future leaders because after them 1798 after that rising of uh, republicanism for independence of self-determination you had the movement of this the young Irelanders and then from there you had the foundation of the uh, the Fenians and the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which would evolve into the IRB, uh, the, from the IRB into the modern day Irish Volunteers and into <laughs> 1916. So the whole thing is linked and they always link each other throughout history. Each one's related to the other. So the United Irishmen met in Belfast and they planned rebellion. The rebellion took place, but what was the outcome of that? Uh, obviously you said that it was a failure. How did it end? Well, the biggest problem with the United Irishmen was that uh, because of the fact that the British were, uh, had the whole movement was riddled with informers. And they sort of knew what was going to happen before you know, many United Irishmen knew what was going to happen. And at the time, all their leaders uh, in, in the north and the south, uh, the, the day of the commencement of the uprising was the 23rd of May. And it went off first in, down in the south, in, uh, in the Leinster area, of course in Wexford and different areas around there. And it happened in the north in June. And it didn't all go off in one go, because what had happened is the British had arrested most of the leaders uh, in the south and had mo arrested most of the leaders in the north. So, for example, Samuel Nielsen uh, was in jail at the time. Thomas Russell was in jail. Henry John McCracken had just got out of jail. So they were very, very sparse. And, you know, the whole movement itself had very little leadership. And they were led by people relatively inexperienced. Perhaps Henry John McCracken was experienced enough. But the rebellion itself fell flat because... So can I ask, what type of warfare was this? Was this like modern warfare? What, were the, what was the weapons? What weapons well, the weapons would have been small cannon. Mm -hmm. for a start and the pike of course the famous pike mm -hmm. and the so they pike, were going against the basically the yeah you're, you're army. talking about yeah you know pike to pike yeah well the british army didn't use pikes they used you know rifles mm -hmm. and they used cannon well the irish so were was already an uphill struggle oh yeah i mean the, the pikes were very good you're talking eight to ten foot poles which would have been able to grab a soldier and pull them off or you could pike them mm -hmm. but that was really nothing against grape shot from a from a cannon mm -hmm. so if you're coming into antrim town as they were 
or uh, or in Balmahinch, you know, the British just had to let go of their cannons and it would just cut down people uh, with the grape shot. And it's very hard to, to beat a cannon against a pike. And unfortunately, uh, that was probably put an end to quite a lot of that. Their, their armaments weren't that good. They had bravery and they had plenty of pikes, but that's nothing to compare to a cannon fan grape shot at you. So what happened to the leaders of the rising of 1798? So following 1798, you have, even the, before the rising, there was so much arrest going on in Dragooning, and most of them were in jail, or most of them had been either uh, deported, or they were already uh, on their way to, to leaving, they are already in jail. And when the ones that were caught, the leaders were all basically executed. Uh, so for example, in Belfast, the likes of the ones that didn't escape. So Henry John McCracken was caught, and he's the son of Belfast, of course, one of the most illustrious ones. So he is caught after the Battle of Antrim, and he's making his way to Carrick to escape, but he's caught. He's brought into Belfast, and there he's had a court martial, and he is tried, and he is uh, to be hanged. And he's, not, he's only given something like two to three hours from the sentence to be hanged. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously it's a very, very sad event. He's hanged in High Street. So all the other people that day were hanged. There was two or three other people. Generally, the heads were cut off and removed from the body and they were stuck on a spike. So for example, the day that Henry John McCracken was hanged, there were two people's heads on a spike on the same scaffold up in the air. And that, of course, uh, was a guy called James Dickey and John Story. Their heads were on a spike for at least three or four months until they had to take them down due to the bad smell. And that would have been the fate of Henry John McCracken. So Henry was hanged, but his head wasn't taken off because the family was so well liked. And there was a deal done that Henry John's body would be taken down and he'd be buried at High Street there in the little church of St. George's. And um, most of the other leaders, like um, Wolf Tone. Yeah, Wolf Tone himself. Well, he's caught, of course, he's in France, he's back, he's caught with a. a after the Battle of Tour Island. Well, he was in France because he'd gathered an army in 1796 that had came in Christmas of that year, but they couldn't land. What army was this? This was a French army, mm -hmm. a French army with 15,000 crack Austrian Republican troops. So they say Austrian, we're on the Austrian front line, they were French troops. So they had to go back to France, but he kept coming back with another army, and he came back with another army. So he go over to the mainland and he Europe went over to, to France. Yeah, them to fight with the Irish. Yep, he went over to France in 17 uh, January 1796. He goes over to France, gets speaking to the French Directorate, and they gave him a huge army, a, uh, an armada, effectively to come to Ireland. And they arrived at Christmas Day, but as they say, the weather was so bad that Tone commented that it was like the second Protestant wind in that it was the greatest escape since the Spanish Armada for the English and Tone sailed back to Ireland with a very disappointed but he would come again two and a half years later and this time it would be in Tory Island off the coast of Donegal and this huge battle is the Battle of Tory Island and it's there that Wolf Tone is captured and he's brought into Bunkrana and then into Derry and then he's brought down to Dublin whereupon he's put to trial for treason Interesting. So, what is your, you know, let's talk hypothetical, let's, let's be hypothetical here. So, if Wolf Tone landed in Ireland and the French beat the English, yep. would we be speaking French to Ireland? Or would yes. we be a part of France? What? We'd be all like uh, la bourgeoisie and la pâtisserie and stuff <laughs> like that there and all this very nice. I don't think so because the, the United Irishmen weren't. You know, Tom was very, and Robert Emmett was like this as well. They were this quite. This is a strict. period, though, that you know, there's all these wars in Europe and all. Yeah, so. I mean, people didn't realise that. You know, we, we don't mind you helping us with our revolution, but we're not letting us come in here to colonise. We're not going to replace the British yeah. with the French. And the that French might have replaced the English, yeah. and then there'd be another yeah, 1916 could yeah. have been against the there's French. A, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, <laughs> are the French going to be here to stay? And the idea is, no, we just want you to help us to, with the revolution. But as soon as we're there, thank you very much. A bit like America, because in America, the French helped the Americans win the war. Mm. Remember, uh, they came into the war. Is America. that why Tone went, went over there? Well, Tone went via America to get to France because France was blockaded. It's very hard. He also told him he was getting out of revolution. He, he wasn't involved. Tone actually landed in America. He went. He went. He left Belfast in 1795. Well, he was he was in Belfast for a couple of weeks, and that's where he went up to Cave Hill, mm -hmm. up to Mancart's Fort, and declared a revolution. Effectively, is where it where it where it transcends into the radical revolution. And then it comes down, he stays for a few more days and he heads up to he heads to Philadelphia from Belfast.
and he arrives in Philadelphia in Wilmington uh, in July and in July he spends the next six months basically trying to make his way to France via goes to New York he just settles his wife down and he makes his way to New York and there from New York he leaves on the 1st of January 1796 at the end of that month he's in France and he arrives in France and as there he makes his way as we talked about earlier to the French directorate in Paris and there of course he rises he raises a huge army to invade Ireland incredible guy I must say I mean even uh, the Duke of Wellington himself praised him he says it was Tung was a, a man of genius to do these things. Innovative. So how did Tung die? Did he get executed? Well, the thing about Tung is there's a great debate on at the moment about Tung's trial and how he was apparently committed suicide. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of research out there at the moment that Tung was actually murdered. Because if you look back at various people at that particular time, a lot of these people are suspiciously being killed. They're, you know, they're, you know, a wall would fall on them in prison or they would get beaten up in prison or their necks would be broke. And Tone's case is that he caught his own throat has been questioned. And um, a good friend of mine, Paddy Cullivan, is doing quite a lot of work on that. And he was able to show that, you know, it's impossible to say Wolf Tone committed suicide because no possibility, it's more than likely Wolf Tone was murdered. And he was murdered for one reason, because they had to kill the revolution. And to kill the revolution, you need to kill Tone. So the 1798 rebellion ends, what happens after that? So after 1798, quite a lot of people are very, very wounded. Um, basically there's defeat of the United Irishmen and everyone's got their head down. And of course within a year or two out comes this active union, which if you understand the active union and how it came about, is probably one of the most corruptest, corruptest, most corrupt piece of legislation ever to come in. It was basically bribed. and. Of course, Castlereagh's job was to bribe everyone, and particularly the ones in the in the Parliament in Dublin. It's very important to realise that the Catholic Church was for the Active Union, and the Orange Order was against the Active Union. And you may ask yourself, why would that be? Because the Orange Order knew that the United Irishmen were beaten now, and they could do what they want if they had their own Parliament, which was a Protestant Parliament. Catholics, Catholic Church backed it was because they threw their lot in with English because they realised they weren't going to get any rights out of that parliament in Dublin, that ascendancy Protestant parliament. So after 17, 1798, you have the Act of Union, and of course things settle down for another couple of years, but up again comes Robert Emmett's rebellion, and that's in 1803. I mean, Robert Emmett is a young man, he's 26 years old, he's a Trinity man, and he of course is famous for one thing only, probably apart from the fact that he's utter bravely in his rebellion, he writes his famous epitaph when he is hanged and beheaded in Thomas Street outside St. Catherine's Church in 1803. And his Rem Emmett's Rebellion is the first rebellion inside the Active Union and that sets off the next generation. And in that rebellion in 1803, it's Thomas Russell who gets out of jail by this time because he's been turned for six years. Russell never gets a chance but he comes out and he's involved in that rebellion but he's caught and he's caught in Dublin and he's deliberately bought by the British to Dan Patrick. Because he is a, he's a court Why man. Down because Down Patrick was. Is it or something? No, it's as much. It's because they like. Because he's beloved of the locals. That uh, he's beloved of the people of the defenders and the United Irishmen of Down Patrick and South Down. They really, really like. He was their commander, and uh, the generals say, "No, I want him up here, and I want him hanged in Down Patrick." And I was going, "Well, yes, it's to teach the people of Down a lesson." And of course, there's a very famous, uh, very famous poem, "The Man from God Knows Where." And of course, that's Thomas Russell. And he's buried in a very uh, beautiful little graveyard just there in Down Patrick. And there's a gravestone. And the gravestone says, The Grave of Russell, 1803. And Miriam McCracken, she paid for that gravestone uh, in uh, sort of later days in her life, in the 1840s and 50s. So, for people today, what's the legacy of the United Irishmen and um, what influence did they have in modern Ireland? I think in many ways the legacy is uh, about unity and it's about the unification of the Catholics and the Protestants and the centres and to be able to rule themselves together to stop looking back to the past and look to the future. Look to the future as an island people with their differences, with their different religions, but we've all got a sharp, a common, you know, we've all got a common denominator where we're all this land. And it's very important to see that the United Irishmen try to say to people, listen, the English are here really for themselves. They're not really here for you. 
and that has been shown throughout history. They're here, and, and when they are here, they will create division among us. But this was the first thing that we've told, and the United Irishman recognises, no, we, we understand that you're really not here for us and for the good of us. You're here to exploit us. But if we get together and stick together, we can make it a better place for everybody. So they realised that these differences that we have, even to this day, they're actually manufactured. Because if you look deeply, we're all roughly the same. We're all very same character. Maybe different by religion, but that's all moot. The United Irish will be able to see well into the future. They're able to vision a better place to live in. Tears up. <laughs> See, I'm really enjoying this chat. It's really fascinating. Um, you do tours, walking tours. Yep. Uh, all related to 1798 yeah. in Belfast and Dublin. Yeah. How can the audience find out about the tours and book one? So you can go into Eventbrite and type in 1798 Belfast walking tour or Dublin and we'll definitely pop up through Eventbrite. And you'll probably find us anywhere in Google in reference to, we pop up in the news a lot. We, we do a lot of different stories, quite unique what we do. Uh, we're also quite pioneering in that we like to see Belfast change and show more about this history. And one of the main things, that we also do is we also do we do private tours, we can do talks, we do lectures, we spread out because it, they, this whole story doesn't belong to us and doesn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. It actually belongs to everybody and anybody can do it. But there's been a great interest uh, from all sides on this, uh, no matter what religious persuasion you are, politics. This seems to get everybody because everyone seems to love these United Irishmen because remember they were united, they were of all religions and they were very much into their equality and looking after each other and I think that's the essence of why they've survived. It's over 230 years since these United Irishmen and women, we can't forget the women and it's amazing that these people have such a strong, uh, a sort of strong pulse in society today. It evokes a sort of romanticism, it evokes a sense of greatness and equality, uh, maybe a better time, or perhaps a time that, a, probably a time that didn't come, but it, maybe it has a time that will come sometime soon. So it's very much a conundrum for many people, but it still is, because the United Irishmen are unique, and that's why people are so interested in them. That's great, Sean. Um, Slauncha, cheers, thanks so much for the Welcome. chat. Thank you. And today, I just want to say best of luck with the tours, and you know, I hope that this video will inspire um, more people to learn about 1798 yeah. go on one of your tours. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.